everybody, and welcome to Virtual TrekCon with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. We are joined by two very, very special guests, Mr. Robert Hewitt-Wolf and Mr. Ira Stephen Bear of Deep Space Nine fame, both of them. I'm going to leap into the audience. Look at it. <laughs> <laughs> crowd surf. Time to crowd surf. So this is a live video. So if you guys that are watching uh, have any questions, throw them out. Maybe we'll uh, address some of them. But we have a lot of stuff to talk about. This is going to be about Deep Space Nine, about writing, about uh, character development. These two gentlemen are always extremely insightful. It's like they're teaching a class when we get to talk to them. Uh, really excited. Really excited we're, to talk we're to We're ready you. to disappoint you. Oh, I have nothing well, to say. <laughs> Any more, how was Jamie and O'Reilly? Because that must have been a cluster. I'm sure they were a lot of fun. Did they answer anything? Yeah, they were pretty quiet Nothing. mostly. They were quiet. <laughs> it was no, like they four. gave no straight answers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I take it you've seen yeah. them. <laughs> I, I, I mean. I, I, I love, uh, you know, I don't see Jake when, when I was going to the conventions, I would, I would hang one of the people I would hang with at times was, was Robert, you know, JG was sometimes there, sometimes not, uh, or he had a significant other there, but, but O'Reilly is a hoot. So I thought the two of them would have been, uh, gold, but I guess what they, they screwed the pooch. They didn't, uh, no, they were extremely entertaining. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they, had props, they had puppets. <laughs> they, 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 would, gave, they gave people nightmares. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. I, I would hope so. They are fun guys. So we're not going to be anything like that. We're yeah. not going to do anything like that. <laughs> I don't know if it's possible. Sirach, what do you I think? I don't know if I can do that again. I, I have to take a nap <laughs> after that. Now I want to go run and grab a puppet, but it's too much work. I'm too lazy. <laughs> <laughs> um... Yeah, JG so, really wore us out. <clears throat> you know, they were almost on the Deep Space Nine panel. Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> that would have been uh, those two, man. Yeah, yeah, they they their own thing. bubble. Yeah. So let's let's talk about this. First things first. This is something I've been thinking of for a while um, because I just sit at home and think about Deep Space Nine oftentimes and do nothing with my life. And I was thinking, like you guys, you're starting off this show. I don't think either of you had, and correct me if I'm wrong, you didn't specifically have any say as to which characters there were there would be. You were just kind of handed these characters, or were you a part of the decision-making process as far as what kind of characters there would be? No, the only, the only and I've told this story ad nauseum, the only uh, influence I had was uh, before I came on the show when Mike was originally talking about it, the whole... O'Brien, the sheer thing, that was something that wasn't in the planning about that relationship. And so that I talked over with him at the Dodger game. And that was, like I said, one of the things that was, the, I said, if you let me do that, I'll come back to Star Trek after having left TNG. If I could make that, if, if we're going to have those kind of relationships on the show, mm-hmm then it's worth coming back to you. And Mike said, well, why would I, why would I fight against the great relationship if you think it's going to be a great relationship? But other than that, uh, you know, uh, Robert, I don't know if you were there yet. Were you there when, when, with, with Pete and myself, when we were looking at the audition tapes and stuff like that? Uh, yeah, I saw, yes, I saw some, when I came on to do Q-less, so obviously I wasn't there at all at the beginning. I, I did a freelance um, Next Generation, and then they, they hired me to do a freelance Deep Space Nine. And when I came on to do q I think they were just finishing casting, or they had they were shooting already, And but you were still looking sometimes at the audition tapes, and, and Pete was like, you know, having, having his moments watching the audition tapes, because Pete was such a curmudgeon, you know? <laughs> um so everything was Pete was like everything to Pete was like a rain of rain of hellfire every moment that you know everything was going to blow up every second. So yeah, um, so we 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 were shown it was nice of Mike to let us see some of these auditions and and at times we would you know give an opinion on on a personal level, but no, that was that you know we got those those. Uh, 
those characters, those actors handed to us and, uh, you know, and a couple of others, you know. Right. And I, was, I, I was a staff writer. I had no, I, I had no input on anything. I just did what I was told. <laughs> I, <laughs> we, had, we, 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 I kept you pretty well freaking informed. No, no, that's true. I was informed. I'm not saying I wasn't informed. <laughs> I was well in the loop of what was happening. I just, uh, you were more in the loop than any staff writer. I think in history. No, I know I was extremely blessed to be able, I mean, Michael and, and especially Ira were super generous in listening to such a snot nosed kid about, uh, you know, letting me express myself. Um, but like, yeah, no, that was all Michael and, and, and Rick, the, all, all the, all the creation of the characters, all the casting, that was all them. So that was all, uh, uh, yeah, that was all existed. You know, they had a 60 page Bible. They had a two hour pilot script. They, they had done an exhaustive casting process. Um, and they got a great cast. I mean, it's a terrific cast, obviously. Right, um, so the, but, reason, yeah. the reason I was, I was asking that is because it just leads me into the, what I was thinking next, which was when you first see the list, the Bible, you know, the, the actors, the characters, and you're first coming on Ira kind of a little bit more in the beginning and Robert a little bit later, it seems. Did you, were there one or two characters that stood out to you where you're like, I really want to write for this character or, or some that were like, extra interesting or, or a character type or trope that you hadn't considered before and you were excited to jump into it? Well, I knew Rene Aubergenois from the Robert Altman films and a lot of other films. So I was excited about Rene. I mean, he was the one that popped out. Obviously, uh, uh, Avery, but Avery was... You know, I was involved with all the, with some of the discussions about that casting, and and um, I was getting calls. This is how I, I don't know, if this is in the, I don't have the companion book. I didn't even take the companion book off the shelf and bring it with me. I don't know if this is in the companion book. But, you know, I got phone calls phone calls from executives around town telling me not like I, I'm not saying I had any power. I had no power, but, but I was on the show and they knew I was a, a producer on the show. People calling me and telling me not to hire Avery, that he's too much trouble, that, that he, he doesn't like white people, that, that it, it was, it was really fucking, it was really weird um that you know that it was it was it made that kind of an impact certainly uh hawk you know his relationship with the uh powers that be must not have been uh too jolly i suppose um because it was like you know on the qt and now it's so long ago who gives a flying so it's 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 easier to say but uh, so the the the, aim, the the casting of Cisco was and Dax, which was a different problem. Uh, but but the thing with Cisco was, as I've said before, we expected someone younger and less put together than Avery Brooks. It was like Avery Brooks is doing this part. Wait a second, which is why I always hated that scene with him and Picard. You know. I wish they could have rewritten that scene because it, it's, it, it would have worked better with a angry younger guy against the mature, you know, older, more experienced Frenchman, you know? Um, but, but it, you know, it was like, it was, it was Avery and I wanted Avery I wanted Cisco to win that argument and to have Picard say, you know what? You're right. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Here, take my pips. Take it all. You know, that's what it felt like to me. You know, yeah, they would have had some of the other actors they had talked about who were, who were younger and and would have hit that a little better. But there's always a there's always like a. Uh 
not, not a friction, but there's always a, a period of adjustment on every TV show when you, when you start the show. And this is like nothing I knew about at the time, but mm -hmm. now, now <laughs> in retrospect, <laughs> uh, there's always this period of adjustment where you, you write the show, you write the characters, you write the Bible, you write the pilot, you have the characters in your head and then you cast them. And once you cast them, sometimes it's a perfect match and you're just like, ah, that's exactly who I imagined. And, and the character is exactly who I thought it was. Sometimes it's not a, a perfect match. And sometimes it, it just, not, not that it's better or worse, it's just different than what you expect. And I think that both, I would say Avery and Terry were different from what, what the page suggested they would be. Really? Uh, and so was, to a certain extent, Odo, I think. Yeah. I think Man. it's fair to say that Renee was a little bit different than what you would have expected Odo to be. They told us Clint Eastwood, right, Robert? They yeah, told they told us Clint Eastwood, and they cast Renee Bourgeois, who is this persnickety, <laughs> like, I mean, he, he is, he is a, a, a spectacular actor, but he is not in the mold of Clint Eastwood. Like, that is not his persona, and that is not what comes through. It's just, it's a completely different, it's a completely different kind of feeling, you know? Um... I mean, Rene Auberginois always, to me, feels like uh, a mid-ranking British officer. You know, it, just in his personality, it just is just he's just kind of got he's a little persnickety and he's kind of judging everyone all the time, and and it just a different it's just a different guy. And so that that period of adjustment was a lot of the first season. A lot of the first season was like going like, okay, here's who the characters were written by Michael. And Michael was there and was part of this whole process. And here's who they are when they are, when we're looking them on the screen. Like we need to write towards who they are on the screen because you can never really, you're not going to make Rene Auberginois into Clint Eastwood. Like it's ridiculous. You're not going to make Avery Brooks play a, 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 a hot headed young Starfleet officer, even though they tried, you know, shaved his beard and made him grow his hair to make him look that way. At the end of the day, that's not who he was. He was a man, you know. He was like the man, and and it was clear very quickly that that's how we had to write him. Yeah, how was Dax different? Yeah. Sorry. I mean, you saying uh, Rock? It's Rock. You gotta. <laughs> well, nope. you know, I I had a comment there. Yeah, I wanted to ask you a follow up on that, and that is. Um, Ira, you seem, you know, you, you're kind of an against the grain person. You're not the follow the follow the everybody kind of guy. You you stand out with your style and and your character and just who you are, your persona. Is there something in that rebellious kind of nature about you that attracted you about Avery and and kind of the the rumorations about who he was? Um. I would only say this about that. Um, my wife has always found it amusing and sometimes very not amusing that I, I am interested in people who are, as you described, I don't consider myself so much that way, but I'm definitely into people who can, who can, who are, who are so who they are and so unique that sometimes they can rub people the wrong way because they refuse to back down on just about anything. And I've always liked people. They, they interest me. They make me laugh. I feel for them because I think there's a lot of pain sometimes buried in all of that. Um, so I, I, I thought that was, uh, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not put off by the, those people, especially if they have, if they bring some, it's not that alone isn't what makes them interesting. If they have talent, if they have a, a brain, if they have a humor that, that, you know, stands out and says something special, then, so I, I thought that Avery was a, was a, an interesting challenge uh, at the beginning because he was imposing and, you know, it, it, you know, it took us, as Robert said, it took us a while and there came a point where I, I felt like, you know, we were all, everyone was trying to convince themselves that Avery wasn't doing the role the way he should have been doing the role and that it was somehow Avery who was accountable 
And then it took us a while to realize that we were accountable, <laughs> you know, especially after I saw him do his Paul Robes in the one. Oh minute. yeah. That was eye opening. Yeah. Yeah, you were there when I came in and said, "Guys, yeah, we're we, we're we're coming at this all wrong, man. Like this guy's amazing, and like what we need to we need to write to him, not try to make him. I mean, we'd already done that with Dax. You were asking about Dax, and I think the big difference for Dax and Terry is that Terry is just this lovely, funny, um, charismatic, uh, uh, bubbly person, you know, and and. Dax was supposed to be very Zen, very like Yoda esque almost, you know, like supposed to be like the font of wisdom and really calm and really even keeled and just like a rock and reliable. And that's, you know, Terry was 28 when she got that role. She was not an old soul. Like Terry, Terry is a, Terry is an open and, and lovely and amazing person but you know, some people just have that old soul quality and that that's not Terry. That just isn't who she is. And so we had already started adjusting that care. We, we start writing techno babble for her as much because like she wasn't like exposition, wasn't her gag, you know, wasn't her bag. And we started <laughs> writing her much more fun and much more unpredictable and much more sort of like, instead of being someone who had eight lifetimes of wisdom, we made her someone with eight lifetimes of impulses eight lifetimes of personality, <laughs> you know, and that worked so much better. Um, but we, when Ira came back from seeing Paul Robeson and seeing that's Avery's one man show where he plays a very famous actor who had a very activist actor who had this amazing life. And, um, when he came back from that, it was just like, this guy's like, we are under, you know, he's been trying to shove himself into this little tiny box that we've been writing him. And he's been doing his best to fit into that box because he's a really good actor and he's dedicated. We need to get him the fuck out, oop, the hell out of that box. <laughs> I think was the, the right, Ira? That was kind of the feeling. Yeah. I, I will say that, you know, when you told me we were going to do develop, talk about the character development, which is very difficult to really talk about, though, sure. though I, I will take the responsibility along with Robert and the other writers. I mean, we developed the living hell out of every character, with, uh, whether they were, you know, top of the, uh, top of the credits or they were recurring. It doesn't matter. But I think thinking it over the two characters, I think we had the most impact on and that we actually changed the characters, fundamentally changed the characters from who they were originally. And that's Dax. Because that became a thing where Robert and I basically said, let's make, you know, Terry talks about it because I went down and talked to Terry about it. I said, we're going to make you more roguish. That was the word. That was the word. changed that character completely, you know, from what she was supposed to be. That, what was it that Rick had told and Grace Kelly and, and Yoda? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was like Yoda and Grace Kelly. <laughs> we can't play <laughs> that. Unless, you know, so it was Dax and the other one who in the first script I ever wrote, I changed that character 180 degrees from how he was in the opening, which is, believe it or not, the character of Ram. Ram was supposed to be yeah. the, the Ferengi of Ferengis. He was supposed to make Quark look like a candy-ass Ferengi, and he was yeah. supposed to be the badass Ferengi. And in Babel, or Babel, or whatever the hell it was, I remember writing the line, Quark saying to Odo, my brother... Couldn't fix a straw if it was bent, and that suddenly became a whole new character. Suddenly, he was the 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 milk toast brother, the brother who was downtrodden, the brother who seemed to be, you know, the village idiot, but who had all this other stuff in him that couldn't come out because of the the his brother's, you know, heel on his neck grinding him into the ground, yeah. you know, and and so those two characters. I think, you know, we took those in, in, in them in places where I don't think Mike and Rick would have, with Ron, they wouldn't have thought of it much because he was just, you know, someone they didn't even know he was going to hang around. But, but Dax certainly, we, we pulled the plug and flushed that character more or less, uh, not totally away, but, but we gave her a much more interesting uh, spin and 
and that, that felt good. Part, part of it is also, uh, there's a theory in writing, I, uh, it's probably, it's not a term that I've ever heard, but I know that I've heard other writers talk about this, is this whole idea that like your characters should each be, um, they don't, they shouldn't overlap in their persona. They shouldn't have like, you shouldn't have two characters who are the same because there's no point in that. And part of the problem with Quark and Rom was Quark was already the Uber Ferengi. Like he was already the Uber Ferengi who, who was all in on the Ferengi uh, philosophy. And so we didn't need a second character like that, but, but to have Rom be the oppressed beaten down young, you know, brother who was trying to like, maybe who was more open to things and maybe had talents that he wasn't demonstrating that gave us a different color. And I think the same to a certain extent is true. Like we didn't need, uh, we didn't need the colors that, that the original Dax was paint was painted with. We didn't need those colors. We didn't need the sort of Zen ice queen. Like it just wasn't, it wasn't necessary to the, to the show. And I think part of that was because, of who Avery was playing Cisco as Avery didn't need that guy. It didn't need that Dax. Uh, like yeah. Avery was so serious and so centered and so like Thank solidly you. there, you know, and not callow at all. And not a young man trying to feel his way through life, but a guy who would, was fully formed. He, he didn't, didn't need a mentor thing. He didn't need a mentor. Like he, he was the mentor. <laughs> so, so, uh, Dax has wild card though. Dax is the person who can go on adventures with Klingons and Dax is the person who who even like in that early episode Dax who who we realized some of her past lives were pretty pretty uh pretty nefarious not not nefarious but well some one of them at least one of them was nefarious. Right. Uh but in Dax it, we, we, it turns out that Curzon was who did some questionable things, you know. And so to make her less reliable and 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 more of a uh, uh, a source of spontaneity in Cisco's life and, and a little bit of chaos um, was just a better, it just felt better. Not, it, not only did it match the actress better, it felt better as a character in the mix. So thanks for listening. So we re- <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's been fun. It's been great. That's what we have for you guys. That's it. We're done. Now we, we recently talked to uh, chaos. Alex, <laughs> Alexander Siddig. <laughs> Who? And he met Sid. Siddig. Sid. And, and uh, one of the things he mentioned was that he, he liked the fact that his character was kind of generic and not uh, boxed mm-hmm. into any kind of ethnicity or, um, you know, he, he liked the fact that he had this generic uh, uh, identity and he did want to be known as black or white, or he just wanted to be this kind of person. Uh, was that a conscious thing that you guys did, or was that just in his head? Well, I don't know. The fact is, he was this young kind of, I know he, he, he acts like he's like, you know, a, a total loser back then, which is a, not true. He was this kind of like good-looking young guy with this British accent. You know, so it was like, you know, and we didn't need to play, you know, a Brit in in the show. You know, they already had a Brit playing Frenchman on the other show. So we didn't need that. (laughs) So so it was like none of that. The fact that he was the thing that we were so focused on was to make him the character that that kind of almost backfired on poor Sid. <laughs> you know, the powers that be came to not be fond of the character that we were writing for him at the beginning. But to make him that kind of like, kind of awkward, kind of very smart, but but constantly putting his foot in his mouth, hitting, you know, in, in the Me Too generation, this his his attack, his uh, frontal assault on, on Dax's defenses would not be going over very well to me. I mean, the only thing you could say about it was so out there. It was so upfront and pathetic that it wasn't, you know, she could just, like, it was a, a little gnat that she could knock away. But that's what <laughs> yeah. we were thinking of, right? We were thinking of his character rather than his ethnicity or where he yeah. came from. Well, and that character is the, they changed the character 
they changed his name when they cast Sid. Like the character's original name was like Amoros or something. Amoros. Like that. It was, uh, Amoros. Uh, for the Dodgers. Yeah, and uh, and love, of course, right? It's Latin. Uh, but the lover, the the guy who wants to be the lover anyway, and they cast Sid, and they're like, uh, you know, let's change his name to something that actually rings a little more true for him. Um, and then, you know, inadvertently named him after his actual real life evil uncle. But, but, um, but yeah, I think, I think he was, it was much more like leaning into that archetype of that kind of guy who had a lot of book learning was really brilliant, but had probably spent like the last had spent his entire life in academia, medical, you know, graduate school, medical school, like lab work, a guy who just had the ideas of what the world was like outside those doors, but never really had the experience. And I think it was a character that spoke to, to Sid. And I think it spoke to the audience too. And, and he had tremendous character growth. I mean, we're talking about character development. Michael set him up to have one of the best arcs on the show by doing that. Like his whole idea was that this guy was the guy who was going to come in and be kind of almost colonial towards the Bajorans and kind of like, flailingly hitting on everything that moved and uh, and and uh, and wanting to practice frontier medicine and i think his vision was always that this guy was going to end up this amazing heroic doctor mm. who you know this sort of that he would end up growing into this amazing starfleet officer i think that that was kind of the idea was yeah. to see that growth over seven years of a guy who starts out at 25 ends at 35, starts out with no life experience, really, ends up with tremendous life experience, having been mentored by Cisco, having learned so much from, from Dax and from everybody else in his life. I think that it, 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 it was uh, probably the easiest character, character arc to execute because it was the cleanest setup of where he started. And you could know where, you know where he was supposed to end up, you know? And so it was just a case of like that was a character arc that didn't change that much. We sort of knew where that was going. You know, real quick, speaking of Bashir, our friend Lawrence Neal says Bashir's behavior would go over better today than Kirk's. So that's, at least there's that. I saw someone else comment on, uh, on the chat. I, I just glanced down and they were saying they knew a lot of key, key people coming out of medical school who are just like Bashir. Yeah, that was you know? our resident doctor, Anne-Marie Siegel, who said that right here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, and I, I think that that is true. I knew, I, I mean, I certainly knew I had lots of friends who went to medical school and they didn't have a lot of time to develop socially. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, I think that that was a lot of fun to do. Yeah. So to answer your question, you know, we weren't thinking so much about ethnicity with his character uh, at all. It was the character that we were trying to, to, to figure yeah. out and ultimately having to defend a little bit when uh, he was not popular with the fans at the beginning. Mm. Yeah, they, they do these things that's called testing, and uh, where, they, where they like show episodes to people, randomly, somewhat randomly selected people, but basically people have nothing better to do with an hour of their time and want to make $30 to watch an episode and like turn dials about the characters, and I think Bashir did not test well. Did Bashir test the worst? Uh, I, I believe... He did. Let's face it, in the history, you know, he was the guy, you know, yeah. that he, put he, the target on his back and said, hey, if you guys want to flush this character, we're not telling you to, but if you want to, we'd be fine with it. So, you know, yeah. it was like, no. Nope. That's what they always do after testing, by the way. They always tell you to kill off the smaller character. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they they, they oh, recommend. Wow. They recommend. And uh, usually the answer is like, please no, you know, you try to be as diplomatically as you can in that situation. Um, unless well, the actor is just a horrible person you don't want to work with anymore, which was the case with none of our cast. I mean, it just, you know, every single one of them was like, there wasn't one where you go like, who do you want to kill off? Cause they're a pain in the butt. You know, we didn't have that. But to give them some credit, they didn't really, yeah. they weren't, tr they weren't like, trying to force us. We didn't have to draw a line in the dirt and say, we, you know, we are not killing you know, We're not getting rid of the share. No, no. It was, it was just the kind of suggestion and push. And it might've been twice. It might've been at the end of season one and maybe at the end of season two. I don't remember, but I, I know it was at the end of one season. For sure. They said, if you want. 
I, it's interesting because then, I, then, I, then, I had that experience on a different show with a very similar character, and it seems like the callow young man who rubs people the wrong way and is trying to make the, figure that things out in the life and is putting their foot in their mouth all the time and maybe doing stupid stuff sometimes is a character that, like, is really great to have on a show, I really do think. But it it's often tests very poorly. That character tests poorly hmm. in general. You were saying, Sirak? I was saying that Nana said that uh, she felt some kind of uh, animus towards her because she played her character in a masculine kind of way, which was looked at at the time as you know something negative um, because there weren't so many strong, you know, really powerful women like her on television. Is that something that you felt uh, in the feedbacks uh, from from any sources? Um, Robert, you want to have, no, I'll take, I'll take, I, it. I, 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 they didn't show me the feedback. <laughs> I, I, I told me about it. I didn't get to see it. I, I will say this. Um, there, there, there was some, a little feedback about that. Uh, I mean, if, if the now was here, what I would say was, you know, at the beginning of the show, like with a lot of the characters in the shakedown period, uh, I thought that the character did at times come off a little one note, you know, because we kept writing to that, you know, it, it was such a, a bold character. The woman, you know, we called her the toughest woman in the galaxy. You know, we called her John Wayne, you know, in, in, a, in a positive way, I, not in the John Wayne of who he was as a human being, which can be debated ad nauseum. But we're talking about the representation, the representative John Wayne, which is someone who is sure of themselves and 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 feisty and, and and will back down to no one. You know, we had to find, you know, you find this thing, we're gonna have a terrorist, next terrorist, you know, and it's like, oh, that sounds like fun. Let's hit that one. It's like the monkeys. Let's hit that one. No, <laughs> we're, 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 we're just some, playing the same note on the piano yeah, over and over again. It's, oh, I like that. I like that. Let's keep doing that. And it was like, whoa, we got to make this, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we got to have more shading. Notes, you know, we got to. And, and so I think it was a, uh, and I think probably it was the actress trying to, you know, really pop, you know, and let's remember she was acting opposite Avery and Avery has a presence. And if you don't want to meld into the background, you could do look, look at what Aaron did with, you know, Aaron was perfectly suited to act opposite Avery because Aaron knew <laughs> no fear. And he would just right. go in and do his, his, his nod thing, you know, it didn't matter who the actor was. And I think, you know, she was most of her scenes, a lot of her scenes, at the beginning, we're all with Avery. And and I think she was just trying to, you know, be a worthy opponent with a small O for him. Yeah. So what? You know, so, okay, that's actors talking about, you know, people hate me because they're insecure. No one no one disliked her. No one tried to get rid of her. It was, it was let's do something more with the character than just have her walk around, you know, like Being a gunfighter. Like a gunfighter, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, I, yeah. I think that that character was always a character uh, people were barely, I think, aware of PTSD at the time. But, but that was a character that was supposed right. to be haunted by what she did, um, supposed to be devoted to her cause and to her religion in a way that, like, a Federation officer never would be. And you know, we always thought about her through the eyes of like someone who fought for the IRA or the PLO, this being the time of, you know, those being the, 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 um, the, the examples of the time that we could think about who had a cause that they, they believe was right and, and did terrible things for that cause. And I think that that, that for character development, I think that the more we leaned into that, the more we found more juice in that we uh, it, uh, her story is really about someone coming to life again in a way uh, someone who has embraced death as a lifestyle and is now on this station with this federation and these starfeet people who 
who don't see things that way at all, who see the world as like this amazing, interesting place that's full of opportunity and, and possibility for growth and change. And I think that it, Michael had a saying about characters finding themselves in a better story than the one they would have written for themselves. Remember that, Ira? Yep. Yeah, and I, I think that that was definitely the, his idea of Kira to a certain extent, and Cisco both were characters that found themselves in a better story than the ones they would have imagined for themselves. And both of them took time to understand that and grow into those opportunities. That was sort of our, our take. And I think if we had written her more PTSD-like at the beginning, it would not have gone over because she would have just been the weak woman who was yeah. not enough to be the soldier. and the it, it would not have worked. She had to establish who she was, that, that veneer, that toughness, that uh, implacable attitude. So then we could peel back the layers and see the vulnerability underneath and the pain and the confusion and the, you know, I'm here to represent my people, but slowly I seem to be siding with the Federation on some things. And I'm realizing that, you know, some of the most important and powerful people on, uh, you know, of, of my race and of my religion, I don't agree with. And so, I mean, Kira was just a great character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, the not, I mean, I, I'm going to keep saying this about everybody, but, but Nana did such an amazing job with her. I, I uh, again, like I didn't know how good I had it or we had it as a writing staff because I too was very young and, and it, I was Bashir, you know, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Um, but we had such a great cast from top to bottom that, that they could adjust and, and they could take on whatever we were writing for them. And they could, they were also looking for character growth and, 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 uh, and kind of tracking their characters over time. And, 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 you know, this is uh, Ciroc, you know, you as what well, you certainly were there and doing an amazing job taking this character of Jake and growing him from a boy to a man over the course of the series, yeah. you know, and that uh, it's a gift when you're writers and you have a cast that can do anything like that, that you, that, you know, if you write a scene where the character is going to pivot or grow or have some kind of breakthrough that the actor is going to play it, that we can write, uh, an episode like C, uh, uh, the, I'm forgetting the name, the one where, where Jake is the war reporter. What was that? What was that? The, I don't remember what that one's called, but I bet you the people in the comments will tell us. Uh, yes. Someone w w anyway, that where Jake kind of goes into a war reporting experience and yeah. like learn and like sees war firsthand and like knowing that we could give that material to Ciroc and he would totally smash it, you know, mm -hmm. um, or, or giving Aaron, the arc of, of uh, only the battle to the strong. Something like yeah. That. Only the battle to the strong. That's it. Yeah. Um, uh, giving, the giving nor the battle to the strong. Yeah. Something like that. Uh, giving, giving, being able to know that you could give, Oh, we just lost a rock. I'm saying all these nice things. And he's, I know he's got a little... cuts out as soon as you start. <laughs> as soon as anyone says anything nice about the rock, his, his internet connection goes bad. Um, but being able to give Aaron like all the stuff they're going to give him about becoming a Starfleet officer, about about his PTSD, losing the leg, all that stuff, knowing we can give him that growth because he as an actor was capable of of playing that growth, knowing that we could give every single person on our main cast those kinds of amazing moments. Yeah, uh, the thing that bugged us, the thing that that I remember bugging us at the time, you know, was yeah. All the thing about whether the show was getting the respect and all, you know, all the stuff that we were feeling about the show, you know, not landing for whatever reason. It wasn't doing what we thought it was going to do in terms of the, the fan base or the, the Trek fan base. But the one element of that within that that really, really bugged me was... Whether you like the shows, whether you like this, whether you like the fact it's on a space station or whatever, there was so much good acting on it, and no one was ever singled out. There was never any, no one ever got like accolades of, of even from the science fiction. Now forget about mainstream. Yeah, you know, forget, forget about Emmys. Happened. But even within the 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 within the fandom and the the genre 
you know, uh, uh, no nominations for anyone. It was just really weird because we thought we had this unbelievable cast and we did have this unbelievable yeah, cast. And they were doing it for so many episodes and for so many years. It was, it was, it was annoying. It was annoying. I mean, it led to the documentary, ultimately, which was, the, you know, the main thing was about the actors. Let the actors speak and, and talk about that time. It's weird. You know, somebody asked a question uh, a few minutes ago. I don't remember their name, uh, so forgive me. But they asked if there were any characters or how you felt specifically about if they were to use Deep Space Nine characters in the current iterations of Star Trek, like moving forward, if that's something that you'd be interested in or specific characters that you'd like them to use, or do you want them to be just kind of left alone as these pristine finished stories? Um, I really don't know and I don't really have much of an opinion. I mean, I'd like the actors to get work, but I don't <laughs> think, I don't think, but that would be the only reason, you know, again, it's 170 some odd episodes and there's plenty of, you know, whatever it, it, uh, the one thing I would hope that they don't do, which is the thing I've always been concerned about is I don't want them to recast, you know, I don't want to see someone else playing Odo. You know, I don't want to see someone else playing Cisco. I don't want to see the young Cisco, particularly, you know, I, I don't, uh, I, I, I'm not joking for any of that. I would like them to use uh, any character that I would get paid for. Yeah, you would. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> I would love them to use Kai Wynn, but, you know, it, it, as difficult as that might be, or, or Martok, or, or uh, any uh, Cassidy Yates. Uh, why not use some Cassidy Yates? Um, no, look, I think that if it could be done in a fun and, and respectful way, I think it would be great. I think that there are definitely characters like I I personally think like you could do a really fun run with Bashir on Picard, for example, and have Sid play him, like or see Quark or something like that. I think it's to me uh, I I would probably steer away from the main characters, you know? Uh, it, it's harder for to do to imagine doing like I was saying, it's harder to imagine doing Cisco. Um, but, you know, we have... We had, I, I, anything that brings attention to Deep Space Nine, though, at the end of the day... I'm That's sure what people are hoping for. Uh, like, especially on shows like Lower Decks, where they're bringing in all these references. Feels like Deep Space oh, Nine's right. getting a few less references. Uh, so I think that might be what, they, what they're talking about there. I mean, I certainly love seeing a Bajoran on on uh, on lower decks. I'm excited right. to see some uh, trill on on Discovery. Um, I think that we that's saw the on. space station for a second. In yeah, the shot. Did we? Yeah. On which on lower decks? It, yeah, when a uh, Mariner was did her flashback. I believe she was oh, yeah, capturing, yeah. and, and there was a joke about O'Brien being like yeah. the most important Starfleet officer in right. history. Um, I, I enjoy that stuff, like I think, but like I said, it's it's more like I feel like shout outs like that are like the kind of acknowledgments I was talking about in a way. I mean, we didn't really get them as much as we would have liked in the day, but I think the show is uh, aged extremely well. And I, I've met some of the people who work on Lower Decks, and I, and they're they're you know it's like the Discovery cast I've met. They're all really good people. Yeah, yeah. And I really like them, and I, I certainly wish them all well. Yeah, uh, Jake. Uh, someone just said Jake would be great on Picard, and I, I, I agree. A couple people have, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to see Jake. You know, I mean, I think uh, it'd be fun to see Jake again. See absolutely. what he's up to. Well, he makes the yeah. most sense. You know, uh, I, I don't know what you're saying about Bashir, but I, I think it would that would be an interesting place to go with with Jake Sisko. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I could see, I could certainly see pitching, you know, him as as out there doing something cool and interesting with his writing and his as reporting. You know, I think that's not a character we've seen a lot of on Star Trek in general. Is like the person who is like an investigative journalist or someone who is like the voice of like the 
whatever fifth estate is it the fifth estate i don't remember yeah. but the, uh, the voice of the media what the fu- what the hell the media is like in the days of picard i have no idea but it yeah. be interesting to see well we saw a, a little glimpse of it in the very first episode there was a lady that was kind of tricking picard and kind of did a bait and switch on them on him and some people said that yeah. jake cisco but I don't think they'd want to bring that him back. It didn't seem like Jake's style, to be honest. Uh, look, I would love to. I think you could see Dax on anything. I think you could right. see Dax in Discovery, like the symbiote. Like, I, I would be totally for seeing wow. Dax That's in 900 idea. years, because why not, you know? Or, or you know, one thing flashbacking that- to see it in, in uh, the, the, the original series day is to see um, gymnast Dax, who had an affair with McCoy. Yeah. In uh, on Strange New Worlds, yeah, yeah, you know, that would be amazing. That'd be uh, fun. Saying, Ciroc, sorry, no, my thing is that uh, out of the new iterations of Star Trek, um, none of them take on the social issues about racism and sexism and and and, and all of the things religion that that you guys took on. Still, I mean, as great as the new shows are, they kind of steer away from that. But we didn't take them on. I I, I, I I refuse to 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 pick up that mantle and say and and clothe ourselves in it because we did not do any of that really. I mean, with we had twenty six episodes to fill, and we wanted to do different types of shows. So if a show was interesting and it was about a subject that uh, you know had some social relevancy, fine. But, you know, we've talked in about past tense and how past tense came along. That was something that Robert was, was had a feel for, and then I had my thing down on, at Santa Monica, and so suddenly it wasn't about, let's, we have to go find an issue to do because we're good people. It was like, we want to write about that. You know, we weren't looking to do far beyond the stars. Mark Dupree pitched some dopey show about Jake and some aliens and some, you know, some sci-fi writers. And suddenly that became a much more interesting show. But so you have to be open for it. But I don't, you know, I didn't see us as other than the fact that, yes, we, we dealt with characters of color and we gave characters families and we gave but in that sense, I think we did some extraordinarily interesting stuff. But, you know, we weren't there fighting the fight. You know, we did rejoin because it was an interesting tale to tell. I, but, uh, I think I think Ira is 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 understating. Really? Did we sit around and go? No, like, no. But but look, <laughs> but, but let's be honest. Like, no, we didn't sit around going like we need to do an episode about racism today you know we didn't sit around doing that but when the opportunity came to to have moments in episodes that were about the characters that we loved and wanted to tell stories about when we had the opportunity for those moments we didn't shy away from them no we we we, we definitely came at the, the stories trying to say interesting things I don't necessarily think we were trying to say political things, but I think we we're trying to say interesting things about the human condition. And when you try to say interesting things about the human condition, you almost always end up hitting on societal issues, PTSD, whatever, what, the, the brutal nature of war, whatever, whatever the episode was about, the, the, the sort of um, the way, you know, cultures treat their soldiers as disposable, you know, a- anything like that. You're, 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 you're I was understating his case. That's all I want. No, we, we, but no, you stated it very well just now. It, it, it was always about character. That is my mantra. I will fight that fight to the bitter end. And that's what pisses me off about tons of television, even in this right. golden age of television. What they consider d- diving deep into character does not seem so deep to me. But I, I'll fight that battle and, and take. What uh, I'll put that mantle on for sure. Character, character, character. Because if you really sure. stick to characters, you'll wind up touching everything in the human condition. The human heart and conflict with itself, it's the only real thing worth writing about. And and But no, it wasn't about, we weren't sitting around like uh, 
you know, let's 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 talk about this war or that terrible thing that's happening or 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 racism or any of that shit. You know? I saw someone in the comments saying, you know, a very special episode. Like we never set out that that is what Ira is saying is correct. We never set out to do a very special episode. Like past tense was not intended to be a very special episode, nor was rejoined, nor was uh far beyond the stars. None of those were it was always they always came organically from trying to tell the best possible story. Mm. So so in that case, yes. I, I think that that what Ira is not giving himself, and I, and I will give him, you know, a huge amount of it. Like he he was the steering force for the show for five years. The the credit that he's not giving himself is that he never shies away from those things. He he does not, as a writer, he's not afraid of of going to the uncomfortable places, societally, character wise, okay. socio politically, all that stuff. Terrific. Good so, stuff. Pretty much. Sorry, guys, but uh, everybody out there still thinks of your heroes. Sorry about that. Uh, whatever uh, they can think, whatever the fuck. They <laughs> think. I, I learned that I have no control over any of those people, you know, for good or ill. You know, I mean, you just got to be, you, you know, they'll they'll speak nice of you, you know, at one point and then at another point they'll tell you that you suck. So, you know, you got to if you're going to take all the, the praise, you got to be willing to, to accept the uh, the brick bats as well. So that's just uh, we did. To be fair, we did write a couple really soggy episodes, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Robert, so you can accept that. <laughs> well, Phil doesn't forgive me, nor should he, for he who is without sin. Right? That was the uh, one. I, 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 it, my name's on that too, man. You begged me. That's on both of us. sat there together and you begged me to, 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 to dump it. You begged <laughs> me. And I said, we, we have nothing to replace it with and we're going to be shooting it soon. But you were right. You were right. You were right. No. It wasn't. Uh, <laughs> take it. We wrote more than we uh, we wrote other bad ones that 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 I, I was I was at least fifty percent responsible for too. So <laughs> I, it was twenty six episodes a year. You can't get them all right. Now, nope. guys, uh, real quick, we have about one minute left before we have to run. But uh, Sirak, any final thoughts? I know you looked like you had something you're about to say. Uh, no, because the question I have has got probably a really long answer. It was about oh, no. Worf and. Do you like or dislike the addition having to add him into the slate? Uh, maybe you can he is a part answer. of the assigned history. He's one of our main characters. We did a lot better for Warp than 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 TNG did, and that's just the facts, Jack. And I don't care. Yes, James <laughs> it or knows it. It's right up there on on screen on your big ass flat screens to look at yourself. <laughs> So that's how I feel. Worf is one of us, even if he doesn't want to be one of us. <laughs> <laughs> he is one of us. So, 100%. Yeah. Great, yeah, guys. Well, great. thank you all very much. Uh, we really appreciate you, and people in the comments are agreeing with what you're saying. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us. I mean, it's always so cool when you do it. I know you're very busy doing things writing things, whether it's books or series or your own projects that you're working on. I know you guys are always very busy and you're always extremely gracious with your time. And we truly appreciate it. Scrock and I talk about you guys all the time. By the way, speaking of Wharf, the next episode we're about to review is going to be the final episode of season three. So we're right there. We're right there. No spoiler. He's imminent. He's Warf. imminent. <laughs> right around the corner. Yeah. Anyway, uh, thanks very much, everybody at home. Uh, Sirach, thank, thank you, you for, for popping in and out. I know you had a <laughs> couple of problems, but you popped out at the worst possible times when Robert was complimenting you. Sorry. Uh, oh, wow. I'll have to rewatch it. <laughs> <laughs> thank, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Ira. Everybody at home. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yep. Um, we got uh, Trekkie Family Feud next, I believe. So check that out in the description box. <laughs> Click the link. And then after that, there's the Promenade. Our virtual vendor's room is called the Promenade. How cool is that? Uh, thanks all very much. And we'll see you next time. They do a great job, these two. So congrats. They really do. They're awesome. Love them. Keep it going, guys. I'm so glad I didn't click end broadcast. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>